This is Adam Watson. Robert Diaz. Levon Baker. You're listening to the Dark Slayer Mafia podcast. And tonight we're going to do a year-end review on the year 2018. Wouldn't make much sense to do a year-end review on 2019 quite yet. No, well, we can do predictions. You, you could still do we a could. review. <laughs> it's a few days old. It is. It is. It's almost my yeah, birthday, this too. Busy. So, you know. Oh, whoa. Yeah. I don't know. You're going to be so old. I'm already so old. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and yeah, this year is going to be hella busy. So, let's get started. Should we start with the web comics, with the comic cons, with what we released this year? What? What do you guys want to start with? Releases. Yeah. Okay, so for releases, well, we might as well mention the Kickstarter first. We did the Ghost Assassin Kickstarter in January. It was successfully... Funded, haven't got it quite successfully fulfilled yet. I did print up the Ghost Assassin Raw copies of numbers issues number one, two, and three. And I have the print-on-demand copy of Ghost Assassin number one. Just got to get the offset one still. But there were people who uh, thought the print-on-demand copy looked really good and wanted me to just go ahead and send that. So I was able to fulfill a few more towards the end of the year on that one. But that should be all fulfilled um, I would say by the end of February, it should be all fulfilled. There are still a few people that I'm waiting to hear back from that I had to send messages to in order to get theirs fully fulfilled that I haven't heard back from quite yet. So kind of seems like that's the way all Kickstarters go. Yeah. When I did Who Will Save the World and I was finally able to fulfill everything and I was so happy there were two people who I didn't have the correct addresses for and all I needed them to do was update their addresses to date, they still haven't done it yet. Holy crap. Would you still have to fulfill that at that point? <laughs> the domestic order, I would just because, you know. The international one, though, was going to Belgium. And as of how many years ago was Who Will Save the World? Like four? Something like I that? I it was longer than that. Back then... So when I first did the project, because it took two years for that thing to be fully completed, back then when I did it, uh, shipping to Belgium for what the guy ordered was going to be like $15, right? And then when it was fulfilled, it had went up to 30 bucks. I'm sure by now, because it wasn't one of the tiers, it was just like a single issue. It was, you know, t-shirt and shot glasses and all that. I'm sure by now it would probably be upwards of 35 or so to fulfill. Holy crap. So, yeah, I kind of think that that one has timed out a bit, honestly. But the domestic one wouldn't be that bad to ship out. So, But, you know, I mean, if the guy were willing to even put in a minor amount of the difference of what the shipping cost would be, then I'm sure I could work out something with him. Right. If there was an explanation for why it took so many years to hear back. <laughs> I lost my password. So, in any case, I printed up El Bovine Morte number one and a half this year. Uh, release that at WinCon. And just did a short print-on-demand run of that one as well. And then I was going to do the four pinups that Melissa Spandry had done. Uh, the ladies of Dark Slinger, a little bit more seductive style, I guess you'd say. That's a fair thing to say, right? Yeah. I was going to do those on like metal or wood, but just completely ran out of time before the show that I wanted them for. So I did print those up on uh, slick gloss poster stock i think those are 100 pound if i remember correctly which was still a nice presentation but i did a pretty short run on all those i think it was like 15 per poster and i still want to do those on either metal or wood at some point in the future those yeah. were just kind of a, a quick stand-in sort of thing we printed up a few trading cards this year did get the christmas card finally done um, it was a little bit too late to send it out to everybody, but I was able to hand out quite a few. Did I give you one yet, Robert? I don't think so. Okay, well, you're getting one as soon as the show's over. It's not Christmas, man. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's still it's still the Christmas card. I got card. Christmas cards from, get? like, the last two years, and I didn't even know him. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, they're just on my bulletin board. <laughs> hey, it's still a neat collectible, you know, so. Yeah, I got They a, turned out really cool, too. I have so. a couple. Yeah, yeah, one of them has a has a nice message on it, I know it that. It does, yeah, I think Kate put that on there. <laughs> she did. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't get out nearly as much physical material as what I'd hoped this year, largely because there were delays in the Kickstarter, 
and I don't want to start going overboard making new material while I still have a Kickstarter outstanding. Oh, and I also reprinted two Chronicles von Helsing that had went out of print. Nice. Did a little bit of touch-ups on both those issues. So, they're second prints. They're also kind of fixed up. The lettering was fixed up a bit, things like that. And the logos are printed with a different color so that you can easily identify them as a second print if you're a collector. Nice. Yeah, I think it was when we were at the library show that I completely ran out of stock on number two and three. And so I had to go back to print on those. I didn't know if I wanted to go back to print or not because I wanted to do the hardcover collection of Chronicles von Helsing. But I kind of need, you know, a certain amount of Dark Slinger material in stock. And we were to the wire on getting those. We had to stop and pick them up on our way to Wenatchee. <laughs> but if we hadn't stopped and picked them up, then we wouldn't have had any Chronicles von Helsing complete sets. And as you guys probably both know, those issues sell a lot better when I can sell all of them together in one set than they do right. individually. That's how I would <clears throat> buy them. Yeah. Well, we sold quite a few sets that day, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, we can get to that when we get to the shows. But Yeah. Yeah, we sold a decent amount. I mean, not record-breaking by any means. Right. But we sold enough of them that day. So, that's what we got out in terms of physical products. or anything either you want to add to that? You'd know better than me about what you got out. Yeah. No, I didn't mean about that. Do you want to make any oh. comments about what we got out, what we didn't, anything like that? Well, the print-on-demand Ghost uh, Assassin, I did get to look at that one, and it looks really nice. Mm. Um, I actually thought it looked really good for what you were comparing it to. Mm -hmm. I didn't picture it was going to look that nice. Yeah, that did kind of suck, having the printer fall through at that last second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, there... It's apparently an epidemic right now with printers going out of business, so. Everyone wants digital. No, it's not even necessarily that. It's just uh, different industries have, you know, pricing wars and things like this. And sometimes somebody will be so hardcore trying to outprice somebody that they'll price themselves right out of business, <laughs> you know. And I think that's what happened with Edward Brothers is they were one of those companies that, you know, they didn't want to be undercut. Like, right. nobody's going to beat our price. It's all fine and good if you can afford to do it, but, you know, they might be getting paper from somewhere that's cheaper than what you get it, or they might be buying it in bigger bulk, you know? It's not always smart to try and outprice everybody. Right. Yeah, maybe maybe you pick the one that's, like, the third cheapest, and then you don't, then you don't think about it. Then you might have a bit more of a cushion. Well, they actually weren't the absolute cheapest. Oh. It was that their quality was the best for the price they were offering. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, I'm not just looking at the cheap price. I'm looking at what well, you sort of quality they're giving bang me. Bang for your buck. Yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, you see that stack of envelopes up there on the long boxes? Those are all printer samples that I got for Ghost Assassin. Holy crap. Wow. Yeah. That's quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and I went through every single one of them and compared. And, and then there's a lot of just things that you have to really read over the quotes to know. One of the companies, they had really good quality and a good price. But I looked over the quote, and they wanted to print it with glossy interior pages, right? I do not want glossy pages. Don't want them. And so I messaged them and said, hey, you know, there's only glossy. Well, it turns out they only stock glossy stock. They shouldn't have quoted me with what I didn't ask for, though. Instead, right. they should have sent me a message, but there are a lot of printers who do that. They'll price it with whatever they view as comparable to what you asked for, instead of just stating, hey, we don't have this stock, here's what we can do. You know, they'll just kind of send you over the quote yeah. as is, and then it's up to you to really check over it and make sure that it has the type of paper that you actually requested on there, things like that. Yeah, it's a good thing you checked all that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I don't want a coded stock. So. Yeah, it can be a little hard to read. Yeah, it's hard to read, and I just, I honestly don't think the colors pop for the interior pages on coated uh, stocks like they do uncoated. So I think comic art looks best when it's on like a flat colored page. Yeah, right. Definitely. I agree with that. Glossy's good for covers. Yeah, 
Yeah, but even at that, you don't want to go too overboard right. glossy. You know, I've yeah, seen it. Yeah, overly done glossy just looks like shit. Yeah, and you can do really cool things these days. Like, they can do uh, something that's called spot UV, uh-huh. which actually works really well if you're doing, like, trade paperbacks, things like that. But you guys have probably seen on either books or graphic novels where one of the characters or something on the cover will be kind of embossed and you can fill it with your fingers when you're running across the page. Right. That's done through a process that's called spot UV coating where they've just UV coated that one specific section of the cover. You know, and that's something that's pretty cool that can kind of add a little yeah. bit. But that's also talking about a graphic novel, not a right. single issue. That's what they generally do with like the like the main character on a page or the logos, right? On a lot of the more modern On graphic, graphic novels. novels, yeah, a lot of modern graphic novels use yeah. spot UV coating. That being said, I don't like it for the saddle-stitched no. 32-page books. I don't like it at all for that kind of stuff. I think it's a different thing with graphic novels because it's a different texture, like mm-hmm. books thicker. If it's on a flimsy, thin paper book, it just doesn't look right. Right. Yeah, it wouldn't look as good. Yeah. No, I don't think so either. It's not as appealing. No, you buy something big and you want to be... You want to be really nice, kind of a little bit flashy. Cause it's, mm-hmm. a, it's everything. Right. You know, you're selling it a bit more. Right. Yeah, and that's actually something we can dig into a little bit more when we do the third pricing episode, which is coming up very soon, and I want you both on here for that. Sounds good. You know, I I feel like there's always so much to cover, but man, haven't we covered everything? We have not. <laughs> Damn. We have not. We have not even remotely dug into all the various types of distribution that comics are getting currently and things of that nature. We still need to go over the DC Walmart issues, which I just showed you one of not that long ago. At some point, we should really go over the Archie Archie Digest issues, which, man, I haven't bought one of those since I was a little kid. (laughs) But I should probably pick one up so that we can go over them. Uh, We haven't gone over the little IDW bagged comics. Have you ever seen those at, like, Bymart? I don't think I've seen those before. So they're sold in the trading card aisle, and they're about the size of a postcard, I would say. And I had actually forgot all about them until we were talking about the spot UV coating. Because these comics are about the size of a postcard, and they use spot UV coated car stock covers. Weird. And they're sold in a bag with like a little standee or a sticker or something like that. And I think they cost like three ninety nine. They're not cheap. But they have Skylanders and My Little Pony. I think they actually do a Ninja Turtle one, too. Hmm. So, look that up, look into yeah, that. next time I'm at yeah, Bymart, sounds pretty cool. I'll pick one of them up. Then we can kind of do a light, yeah. you know, when we're doing the pricing, we'll go over all these different systems that comics are well, existing like in currently. Sounds like a fun idea with, like, a little standy and stuff in it. Yeah, so there's going to be a third pricing episode coming up. The pricing episodes also, by the way, out of all the podcasts we recorded last year, have proven to be the most popular. Really? Yep. Really? Very well, I guess so it, between YouTube and all the various places the podcast is available for download and things like that, it, those have had the most listens. Nice. I guess everyone, <laughs> yeah, you're always thinking about what you're paying for your comics. Yeah. That's yeah, and it's something as a creator, as a publisher, you know, something like that, that you need right. to know. And uh, everybody <laughs> seems to have an agreement on comics being too expensive. But there are very, very few people that are actually taking an active interest in trying to figure out a solution to that problem. Solution is they're just going to keep buying them, man. Yeah, but they're <laughs> not, and that's the problem. Someone's buying it. Yeah, but... Only a, the really hardcore people that... The numbers of comic shops are shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So that's something we need to go into in another episode, though. For now, we'll just kind of stick... With the year-end review. So, <laughs> so should we go to conventions so, next? Total detour. Yeah. Or should we go to the web comics next? Uh, mm-hmm. go, I'd say go to web comics. Okay. Yeah, I think that sounds like a good order. Okay, so this was definitely the comics. biggest year for web comics that we've had potentially ever. So we launched Mini Slingers this year and managed to get a full 19 Damn. pages updated for that. Uh, Inspiratu saw kind of a sort of kind of launch. I want to call it the real launch. Yeah, yeah, it's more like a preview. Right. And we had one page for that, plus one of the Elbow Vine Morte pages featured in Inspiratu uh, that Levon did for uh, for the Fourth of July. And actually, that one is not listed in here. So let me make sure I have that correctly. So for Elbow Vine Morte, 
we did 21 pages of issue number five. There is one more page coming from El Bovine Muerte, but obviously it's not going to be posted until this year. We did 22 pages of issue number four, so all of issue number four was posted in 2018. We did four pages from the El Bovine Muerte Ghost Assassin little special that was made to advertise the Ghost Assassin Kickstarter as well as, you know, just tell a funny little story with El Bovine Muerte. We did a Valentine's Day pinup and the 4th of July pinup, and I actually need to check to see if we did any other holiday pinups with El Bovine Morte this year, because off the top of my head, I don't remember. Things are starting to run together of if it was 2017 or 2018. So, oh, we did Valentine's, we did Easter, and then we did the 4th of July. So, Valentine's and Easter were both done by Pat, who does the Mini Slingers. And so, in total, we had, let's see here, we had 90 pages of El Bovine Morte posted. Damn. Quite yeah. A bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, in total, we did 120 webcomic updates. Holy crap. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a yeah. big number. Yeah, it is. That's the biggest number I've ever done. You know, El Bovine Morte was the only webcomic up until this year. I saw an issue and a half released in a year's time of that comic before now. So that being said, there is going to be a brief delay with EBM in 2019 because I still need to finish up the writing on issue number six. I had to go back and rewrite a bunch of it because I wanted to incorporate this new storyline idea that I thought of of having Lay Mime run for president. So there's going to be a brief delay, but I'm going to try and make that seem a lot shorter by maybe contracting a few artists to do some El Bovine Morte pinups. So Levon, if you have any ideas, you yep. know, pitch them my way. Sounds good. Just generic pinups? Yeah, I'm not really looking. I mean, you know, tying them into holidays is a great yeah. idea, even if they're like the stupid made up holidays. Right. So I have no problem with doing, uh, you know, dog day or cat day or you know whatever if we can work it in you know right. make it stupid make it fun you know a so, cheese pin up yeah yeah is there a national cheese day there's got to be one of those oh, right I'm pretty sure, sure there, there is, is. yeah, is the yeah. national day for everything yeah so in addition with elbow vine Morty though i do have the halloween pin up done for 2020 and i also have a little election day pin up that's already done for that so, <laughs> so you know, we're ahead in ways on that. It's a good thing, though. Right? So, in addition to the web comics, we did 43 different podcasts. So, it's quite a few Damn. podcasts. And it looks like Robert got syphilis in 2018. Which is curable. <laughs> it's curable, so it's okay. <laughs> now, he got the penicillin-resistant strain of syphilis. Oh, that's even worse. No one told me that. Ah, well... <laughs> You should have talked to me instead of a doctor. Oh, you're so. right. Just think these things through now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, what do you guys have to say about the podcast, about the web comics, any of that? Forty three is pretty good. It's how many weeks are in a year? Like fifty six. Fifty two. So yeah, that's yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, we took a few weeks off here and there. Um, For like different holidays and crap. Different holidays, and I kind of bottomed out a bit this summer. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to get my eBay store back up and going and doing all this, and I just was having a difficult time juggling both. So I decided to take a couple of weeks off from the podcast while we just focused hardcore on, you know. Makes sense, though. Yeah. So, yeah, but I mean, 43, there were only nine weeks that we didn't post a podcast. Yeah, so that's crazy. That's not bad. Yeah, and two of them obviously were holidays yeah. that we know of. So. Yeah, well, that's let's see. Good. We took the 4th of July off. We took Christmas off. New Year's. And then we ended up taking New Year's off, too. That one wasn't really planned. It was just more of a we couldn't find the time to do it sort of thing. Um, and I think I think, I think think we might have taken the week of Thanksgiving off, possibly. Um, I think so. Yeah, so I think the majority of the time when we took any time off, it was just because of a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, for the Mini Slingers, let's see, we did the Christmas issue. Which was the biggest storyline so far in that. We did the Halloween issue, and then the rest of the things were pinups. We did the Mother's Day pinup, 
where Le Mime has drawn on the wall, but he's trying to convince his mother that it was Muerte, who is a plush in that world, not a real cow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then there was a school's out pinup that Patrick did that looked like uh, the cover for Giant Size X-Men number one. They had the kids running towards the reader with all the parents gasping in the background, you know, <laughs> because school's out and that's terrifying. <laughs> what about a Muerte pinup? Just a pinup of Muerte herself? Yeah. Doing what? I don't know. Just you, If you're going to go for pinups, you do them all and then add, throw one. I want there. You want to throw one in that's cheese. Like you have all your character, 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 cheese, uh-huh. character. If you're going to do it. It'll be funny. I it's have to say cheese. it's actually <laughs> a lot more difficult to get the artists to do something with characters in El Bovine Muerte that aren't lay mime. So far, Pat hasn't had that problem with Little A Mime and the Mini Slingers. You know, he's been uh, pretty good about using all the characters. But it is a problem when I'm doing, like, the EBM pinups. Where we have all these other characters, but it's always Lay Mime they want to draw, right? And it's like, we got this four-armed mutant guy, this guy who's got a brain on his chest underneath his beard. And yet everybody just wants to draw the mime all the time. So. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, he's fun to draw, too. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Because he's crazy. And you right? end up doing crazy things with him. Right. So I am not at all opposed what if it's to doing like a, a pinup with just Morte. <laughs> what if it's like a cheese sculpture of Morte? That, that could, could work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But the hope... Uh, no, I don't want to go there yet. So we'll wait until no, we're a little bit more into Don't want to talk about something? No, I don't want to talk about it yet because uh, one of the pinups coming up does not feature Lay Mime at all. And it was a piece that was pitched to me and I absolutely loved it. it. And it featured a character no one ever seemed to want to draw before now. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. I love this. And so uh, one of the pinups coming up is is going to be one of the side characters. This is the one that you, I've seen before, right? You've seen it, yeah. yeah. I don't know if I know this one. You may not. Um, I'll tell great. you. I'll tell you later. I don't want to tell you on air. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So, is there anything you guys want to say about this? Have either of you actually read all of the web comic updates this year? I have not. You bastard. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> I've read the printed copies, and anything that I've read online was here and there. Okay. Uh, mostly because, like I said before, I have to use my phone to view anything, and the page is very difficult to load on my phone. Okay, uh, well... With the size. I will say, with the size. Because huh. I have to enlarge it on my phone to actually read anything. Well, I, I am going to be putting a uh, PDF pronounce... No, not pronounced, PDF copies up on some of the digital sites to just download. Yeah. So you'll be able to read the web comics. Nice. That way too, and it might be easier if the rest of the stuff from the website's not around it. Yeah. One of the big reveals in Noble Vine Marte this year, I posted it on a day that there was some gigantic news about Trump that wasn't even that gigantic of news. It was just like, he did what we thought he did. <laughs> Well, yeah, we, we knew that. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, uh, so I didn't feel like hardly anybody paid attention to it because of that news. But one of the things that got posted this year was the big reveal of why the general took Morte from oh, Le Mime, yeah. clear right. back in issue number one. So that's not something I knew ahead of time. That's just something that just occurred to me and I decided to run with it. Do you guys already know what that is? Yeah. Yeah, you told us about it. Did. Did you tell? Was it like the huge, a huge reveal? I don't, I don't quite remember. Well, I can don't you, know can how you continue, huge the real. Can you continue well, to talk? Like, do you want to talk about? Yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we we oh, can okay. talk about it. It's already posted on the site, so yeah, it's that Morte was taken because the general actually works for the greeting card industry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's just so random, right? <laughs> yeah, but the whole reason I thought of it is because I was writing and I did what a lot of writers do. When they can't think of what to write next, I picked up my phone and started playing. And I uh, got a notification from my messenger on Facebook that said it was someone or other's birthday tomorrow, right? And I was like, man, how many people don't buy birthday cards anymore because they can just push a button that says happy birthday? Like, I don't even have to type it out. I know you don't have Facebook Messenger, right? No. Okay, you don't even have to type it out. It just asks you if you want to press a button and send a happy birthday 
So yeah, you don't it even, gives you the whole message and everything. And you, don't just, even, yeah. you don't even have to think when nope. you say happy birthday to someone anymore. Nope, nope it'll nope. just say, like, Robert says happy birthday. Yeah. And so I was like, how many people don't buy greeting cards because of this? Because you can just do it all on Facebook so easily, right? I bet the greeting card industry is not happy about that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I decided that, you know. I was reading an article earlier about... I mean, it's, it's a real odd segue. It was about Norwegian lunch. Okay. But um, that that makes me think of it because it, it mentioned taking the small decisions that we make in our everyday life, mm-hmm. taking that power away, just doing something simple, doing the same thing every time. So maybe that that's what the world is leaning towards, taking out those little decisions. You know, oh, I'll just click the button. I don't have to think. I don't right. have to do anything. Makes sense. To save your brain power. For making your decisions throughout the day so you don't get decision fatigue. <laughs> decision fatigue? Yeah. Is that a thing? I I guess it is, you know, because it, it talked about other famous wealthy people uh-huh. that built stuff or ran <clears throat> things. That they do the same things every day. The simple things, so they take these small thoughts out of it. Like, oh, one of the people okay. that they talked about was Mark Zuckerberg. He wears the uh, same thing every day because it's one less decision to have to think about. He wears the same thing every day. Same clothes to work. Same t-shirt and jeans. Oh, wow. <laughs> Gross. Another, another one they talked about was, uh, I don't know if it's true, but it said Obama. He always, he didn't have to think about what he wore. It was either this suit or that suit. It was blue or it was... Yeah, he, he Black, only had, like... like Three different choices that you saw him in public in. Yeah. All the time. No, that does make sense. I don't yeah. ever put any thought into what I'm putting on. I just put on something that's clean. So I yeah, guess I don't really it. have to worry about the decision unless I'm doing a convention. And, and then all, I will actually right. sit there and look at it a little bit more. It all stemmed from what the Norwegians take for lunch every day and how pretty much everybody takes the same thing every day to lunch throughout the whole country. And it's bland. It's... Not satisfying, but it's one less decision <laughs> that they make. And it's part of their culture. Huh. Weird. Huh. I can send it to you later. Okay. I would be interested in reading that. It didn't sound tasty. No. No, like the whole idea of that just becoming so monotonous as a society. But we really are when you think about it. Yeah. Because you do damn near the same things all the time anyway, you know? Well, it, it compared the productivity that they show. Uh-huh. Uh, that they, they get from working as opposed to... It was on the BBC, so it was comparing it to the UK's. Okay. But, like, you view... Uh, so, bringing it back to comics. So, I know you haven't witnessed this, but you probably follow at least a few comic shops yeah. on uh, social media, right? Yeah. And do you see the posts when they get their comics on a day that's not Tuesday night? I don't think I've ever noticed it. you know, like, like that. comics are supposed to be, like, new comic day Wednesday, right. right? So, generally, a shop will get its comics on Tuesday night. Right. And if they get it on Monday or Thursday or whatever because of Christmas or New Year's or, you know, whatever there is is fucking up the delivery schedule. Yeah. All hell has broken loose and nothing is going to work right <laughs> because they're getting the comics one day difference, right? But you've taken that routine away from somebody by doing right. that. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And actually, that's something we should delve into more in an episode coming up in 2019. Because the comic industry is pretty much dependent right now on routine. Everybody likes routine. I can routine. see that, yeah. It would think of how many comic shop owners are ordering material that they can't actually sell. Yeah. Because they've routinely bought it for 20 years. And think of the people who are buying stuff that they then come to, like, the Frankenstein shows, the Sasquatch shows... And complain to us because they hate it so much, but they still go and buy it on a weekly basis. Yeah. Because that title is their routine, right? <laughs> it creatures of habit. Right? So that's actually something that we should delve into a little bit more. Yeah, that could be fun. Yeah. But anyway, that's a nice little segue into the cons that we did this year. So let's go ahead and talk about those. So the first show of the year that we did was the I Like Comic Con that happened in Ridgefield, Washington in February. That was a grueling two days of hell. So yeah, it did not sound fun. That show 
you know, forgive me for the extra foul language, but it was a it was a jerk off fest. Was it? It was a total I jerk off fest. Yeah, yeah, I was happy that I didn't go after I heard about it. I you you it. could look at any picture online of yeah. the show and see barely anybody in the aisleways, right? Jesus. But you hear any of the official reports or the reports from some of the more reputable, like, big, big comic shops. Right. And it's all about how it was, like, one of the greatest shows on earth. And, you know, <laughs> they had to have inflated their numbers so damn bad. Yeah. You know, I made some cells there, and I got to talk to some people, and I got to pass out some material for the Ghost Ass and Kickstarter. Uh, I had a lot of people there that when I told them what the Kickstarter was and all that, they responded with asking me if it was funded fully. Yeah. And when I said, you know, oh, it has this much go to the, they wouldn't even look at the project unless it was successfully funded. Dang. That was kind of a, a weird sort of wake up call to me. Because I didn't realize there were so many people that won't even look at a Kickstarter that's not successfully funded. Yeah. So, and also kind of seems strange. Because if you look at something and you really like it, and you pitch $8 and and it's not successfully funded, you didn't lose anything. Right. It doesn't even take your money. So, the risk would be there more if it's successfully funded than if it's not, right? Right. That's what I thought, at least. So... That was kind of a little bit of a uh, strange, I guess, market research, I guess you could call it, that I did there, you know? So I was surprised to hear that from so many different people, but there were some fun elements to that. I got to see some friends that I hadn't seen for quite a while. Uh, Tony, the artist on Chronicles von Helsing, uh, he stopped by and hung out with us for quite a while on Saturday, I think it was. I got to interview Lucas Kettner and Floyd Sumner, saw quite a few people I barely ever see anymore because there's just not that many creator focused cons these days and i wouldn't go as far as to call that a creator focused show by any means but there were a lot of common creators that were there so but overall that show just kind of suffered from being completely overpriced for a first year show and quite frankly badly ran so elias was my helper there i know neither of you can really add anything to that yeah. one but I would have been a lot less disappointed in that show if it had been a one-day event. Makes sense. It was too big of a time drain and too big of a money drain for what the show was, which was, quite frankly, a nothing show that could have been done in half yeah. the size that it was. It didn't even need to be in that big of an area. But I heard a lot of platitudes about it afterwards, which I thought was rather strange. The people that I talked to that aren't afraid to be open and honest, though. Like, I met, or I talked to three people post that show that thought it was a great show, and they did legitimately, you know, make some decent money there. Met some decent fans, things like that. But everybody besides us, sorry, was just like, you know, it's the worst show. If they do another one, I'm not going back. And, yep, that's where I'm at, too. I have no plans. I, I have not seen any announcements for a second year, but it I have absolutely... Great. Yeah. No, I have absolutely no plans of doing another one. So, overall, I did not like that Comic-Con. So, you know, I think that's what we posted the podcast recap as, too, that was after that show, was Could've I don't I, like Comic-Con. I, 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 remember, I remember you telling me about it, and it did not sound good. Uh, no, we were not it, happy was, with it. it was not a good show. But that leads into the second show we did, because the first one of the year we did, I have to say, was one of the worst Comic-Cons I've ever been at. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of comic cons you go to that just don't have the people there or the people just, they're not into what you're producing, right. you know, something like that. That show, I can say, was one of the worst because it was one of the worst ran shows I've ever set up at. Uh, but the next show was fantastically ran, set up very, very nice, which is almost kind of weird because it was a tiny show inside a library. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the Hillsboro Comic Fest that happened in February. And Robert helped me uh, one day that show, and Elias helped on the other. That show was fantastic. That was good. That was our best show in two ways. So that was our most profitable show of the whole year. And that was also the show that we sold more Dark Slinger product at than any other show of the whole year. Now, we were only selling Dark Slinger product at both that one and the I Like Comic Con. And some of the other shows, we were flipping, you know, long boxes. You both know that. Yeah. But this one, Simply Dark Slinger products, we moved 
a lot of stuff, uh, not just comics. We sold quite a few buttons. We sold quite a few glasses. glasses yeah. uh, we sold quite a few posters, didn't we? Uh, I don't recall the posters. but I think we sold at least at least a handful of posters. I Could mean, have been. a decent amount. That show went really well. They're going to be putting it on again in 2019. It's not going to be until the summertime this year. I've already been invited back and will gladly be going back. Nice. If that show, I was scheduled to be on two panels, but only made it to one. Because we were really busy when they were doing the one. Uh, but I was able to make it to the second one. Which happened to be right in the same room that I was already in. <laughs> so that worked out well. I think there were only something like, what, 10 to 11 vendors there? Maybe 10. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was really small. It was really small, but it was it was really good. Some of the other creators that were there that I talked to, you know, some of them did really well, some of them didn't do so well. But I have to say to some of the creators that didn't do so well there, they weren't really doing a whole lot to draw people in either. If all you're going to do is sit behind your table and talk to each other and kind of ignore people when they walk past your table, you're not going to do well at a show. Yeah, it's not going to do any good. No, I did talk to quite a few people who did really well there, and we did excellently there. I'd gladly return. And one of the coolest things about being a library was that when it got really slow, during the hours that you kind of know are going to be slow, like, you know, three to four is going to be slow at damn near any con there is. Right. Even, like, ECC gets really slow between, like, three and four. I just walked over to the graphic novel section, picked up something that I wanted to read, brought it back to the table, <laughs> read it, and returned it at the end of the day. And one of the librarians asked me what I was uh, looking for. You know, I told her, I was like, yeah, so I'm doing this show over here. Is it okay if I just take that back there and read it? Oh, yeah, go ahead. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> It's a library. It's what yeah. it's for. Yeah, she's like, you can just leave it on the table when you're done. I was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll take the time to return it. But, but yeah, I got caught up on a few graphic novel series that you know I had read uh, previously and hadn't had the chance to pick up the continuing volumes of. So that was awesome to be able to do, too. Elias saw me doing it on Sunday, and he rushed over and picked one up, too. So <laughs> <laughs> It was... The nicest library I've ever been to. Too. Oh, it's super, super nice library. And did I tell you that when I went back there the second time, I actually got to go into the returns area with the big conveyor belt? No. So one of the things that amazed us about it is they had like this weird ATM thing where you could just return the books in a slot. Yeah. And I'm sure people are from big cities are making fun of us right now. But, <laughs> but our local library is like, what, three rows of DVDs, 30 rows to 40 rows of mainly outdated books with a few graphic novels and a few newer books thrown in. <laughs> Some funny, magazines yeah. flanking the walls. So we had never seen a library like this. Like right. the Oregon City Library is not like this. I would say this one is actually nicer than the Multnomah County Library. I haven't been to that one. It's it's big. It's really cool. I haven't been there for I years, granted, but this like one did seem one, nicer. I'm not sure. Uh, one of the problems I have with Multnomah is you still very much know you're downtown when you're at that one. Hillsboro was kind of cool because... It's in the city, but it's not in the city. You know right. what I mean? It was out of the way. Yeah, it was out of the way. It had like a nice little park around it and, and all this kind of stuff. There was a bunch of people there. There were tons of people there. We got and there when it would open, and there was people literally waiting at the door to get into the library. And I will say, Dang. if you are looking to build a kid's audience for your comics, hit up all the library events you possibly can. Yeah. Because there was kid after kid after kid there. And... They had a little snack section, too. Yeah, they fed us. <laughs> nice. They fed us not just snacks. They gave us, like, full-on sandwiches yeah. and everything. So, yeah, we didn't have to go anywhere for food. And one of the greatest parts is it didn't cost a dime. That's awesome. Like, the only uh, cost I had going into it was the gas that it cost me to drive there. Beyond besides that, there were no costs because the table was just something we got yeah. just for showing up. So, the panel was on comics... In the digital market, it was a pretty good panel. It was all right. Let's see. Beyond and besides that, I don't know if there's really anything else to say about the show. Robert, um, you were there for half it. If you go, leave on next year. Yeah. Or this year, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's what we're in. Yeah. Bring some dry erase markers. Oh, yeah. Because in the little um, break room area where they had the food, there was a big whiteboard. And, you know, I, I can't draw, but I found a marker, and I, yeah. I wrote, like, thanks for having us nice. on there. But that could be fun. You could actually draw something on there real quick <laughs> yeah. and leave it for them, like, saying, hey, oh, hey, thanks for having us. Definitely. I think that'd be fun. Yeah, they had wrote on the whiteboard, uh, thank you all for attending 
the comics fest, you know, to all the vendors and yeah. that, and Robert had wrote. Uh, thank Thanks you for having, for having us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of same sort of subject, a little off our norm, our topic right now. Okay. My, my friend works for a hospital and the, I think it's, it's either one of the pharmacists or one of the doctors there. They put in a bunch of whiteboards that were supposed to, like, throughout the whole hospital, it's supposed to have information written on them uh-huh. throughout the day, but no one ever used them. It all went to waste. And they were always blank. So he spends his time drawing on the whiteboards these famous, uh, other famous paintings. He draws them in whiteboard. And he's <laughs> really good at it. Oh, yeah? That's pretty cool. Yeah, you should get some pictures of those. I want to see that. Yeah. <laughs> he sent them to me, but I don't know if I have them anymore. It's really impressive what this guy can do. Huh. I wonder what he can course. do on uh, paper with pen then. Right. I bet he's pretty good. So, did you know he was an artist before then? The The doctor? Oh, it's a doctor. It's a I thought doctor. you were talking about your friend. friend. Oh, okay, no. okay. <laughs> it's just a doctor that I, I, he does it in his free time. So it's his way of blowing off steam or something, you think? I guess, and to add a little something, because no one ever uses these boards. That's Might as well cool. use them yeah. for something, then. Yeah. That is, that is that's cool. I would do and the same thing. Dry erase is hard, yeah. because you can erase that stuff with your finger. Right. He showed me, the most recent one he showed me... Um, I think it was waterfall, and there was a big negative white space in there to kind of make the sort of puffy cloud of it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was really cool. Huh. <laughs> I'd be interested in seeing this. Yeah. Okay, so back to the cons. <laughs> <laughs> so in March, we did the first Frankenstein of the year. Who helped me with that? Um. Was that you or was that Elias? Uh, these things all run together for me. Yeah, I, I, I feel like better. it was Elias when we talked about it. Yeah, I think that was Elias. Uh, there's not really much to say beyond and besides, you know, Frankenstein's are always fun shows. Yeah, they're good. You can find stuff for cheap. You always end up making money when you table there. I'm looking forward to the one that's coming up next month. You know, I'm hoping to get a table there again. So, yeah, there's not really a whole lot else to say about that. Frankenstein's are always fun. They're yeah, always good. Frankenstein's are always fun. Uh, it's not a show for selling a lot of Dark Slinger material. You know, that's right. a show that I sell a lot of 50 cent issues and cheap trade paperbacks and, you know, things of that nature. But it's fun, and I always spend at least 20 bucks and come home with at least 40 things that I didn't have before, you know, something yeah. like that. So <laughs> Because I get stuff for like a quarter. <laughs> yeah, you find things you want, you find things you can flip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some of it's to flip, some of it's to keep. Yeah. So, I think at the uh, Frankenstein's this year, I found far more stuff I wanted to keep than to flip. <laughs> but, but, you know, in just a couple of years, I went from one magazine box full of comic industry magazines of the past to doing Frankenstein and Sasquatch and having four of those magazine boxes filled. Dang. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's too many. Well... Not for what I want to do. <laughs> well, when it's that cheap. Right. It's like I started with half a short box of comics, and then after the first, uh, was it Sasquatch? Yeah. I think when, yeah, between that and, like, going through the boxes here, I I filled that within, like, that first trip. Yeah, I believe that. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that. Yeah. So, and if you're into the more expensive stuff, there are people who flip that stuff there, too, you know? Yeah. I think I flipped at least a couple of uh, twenty-five to fifty-dollar issues there, but I've seen people at those shows that are selling, you know, multiple thousand-dollar books. Yeah. And I know at least one of the books got sold at the last Frankenstein that I was at for uh, four or five hundred bucks, something like that. Wow. Yeah, I only know that one for a fact because I actually saw that transaction happen. Damn. So the next show we did was in April, and that was WinCon, first show that you went to, <laughs> Levon. So yeah. that show was Levon and Elias helping me out at. That was the first time Levon had ever actually hung out with me, besides talking to me for like 15 minutes here and there at his work. Yeah. You just <laughs> got in a car with a stranger, and he drove you hours away. <laughs> Which freaked yeah. his mom out. Oh my god. <laughs> I need his address and his phone number if anything happens. What do you think he's going to do? Just leave me in friggin' Wenatchee? And what would my address do either. if I'm in Wenatchee and something happened? Right. Well, what's it going to do if you left me there? 
why would I leave you there? Because <laughs> you're just some random stranger that picked up her son. You're not making enough sales. You're staying here. <laughs> In the creepy bathroom of the gas station. Creepy bathroom at the gas station. Yeah, the oh. sold like all sorts of weird stuff. It in it. it sold adult novelty products. Yeah, we'll just oh. put it like that. In quarter machines. That's a classy. Yeah. Place. And you had to ask for the key to get in there because well, the side around the back. He got a little bit ahead of himself. So when we got into Wenatchee, we didn't realize that the entrance to the con was in the very very back of the building, right? And. Every place around there seemed like it was closed, but we figured if we just parked, we were within walking distance of McDonald's, you know, all these places, we could find somewhere to go to the bathroom, because we've been on the road for like eight hours, right? Elias falls asleep in the car, and so Levon and I are walking all around town trying to find a place. Go to McDonald's. Nope. Lobby's not (laughs) open yet. Go to this place. Nope. Not open yet. Go to this place. Nope. Not open yet. So finally we found a gas station, like, in the middle of town (laughs) actually had a bathroom that you could use and yeah there were uh, it had adult novelty products in there and i haven't actually seen that in any bathrooms and god i don't know how long <laughs> i've never seen that in any bathroom oh you haven't i've no. seen them they had them few. in the bowling alley when i was a kid they used to have them in the oregon city uh, movie theater in the men's restroom uh, they didn't have those type yeah, of adult not to novelty that extent, products but yeah there yeah. was they yeah, had a few things. They had like breath fresheners and things like yeah. that, and the little novelty thing at the Oregon City Theater. That uh, I completely forgot that those things existed. They should bring that back. <laughs> well, apparently, go to Wenatchee. That's where yeah. they still exist. <laughs> it's, it's in. I mean, it's it is kind of it's a novelty to look at, but you know, you, right. you see it and you're like, oh, hey, that's kind of cool. Yeah, Levon was so disappointed that neither of us had pocket change. Yeah. Because he wanted to buy some so yeah, bad. Like, this it's is a souvenir. So I took a picture of it. I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> and to someone that's just hearing, like, your flash go off or whatever in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> what are you doing in there? Why do you keep saying it's so weird? <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had done a show in Wenatchee in 2017 which was the Wenatchee Toy Show. And so I was expecting it to be kind of a similar style show, but it really wasn't. This was more like a really tiny version of Rose City. Very low budget version of Rose City. Yeah, more so than a bigger scale version of the Toy Show, which is what I had kind of envisioned. So it had a lot of the problems that the bigger cons suffer from. Like there was a lot of impetus put on the cosplayers. They were actually giving away free tickets to get autographs by the celebrities. And most of the vendors didn't even want the tickets. They were so, giving us... We were, like, giving them to each other. Yeah. At that point, yeah. None of us ever got one of the autographs. Uh, no. Is, uh, the celebrities weren't really a draw. You oh, know? Right. I think the biggest one out of any of the celebrities was the lady who did the voice of Dee Dee on Dexter's Laboratory. Oh, that was a good show. It was, but do you really care about having her autograph? It would be funny. I mean, I guess yeah. maybe if you're like having the whole I'm not signed by everyone on the cast. Yeah, I'm not an autograph seeker. Right. So, I would have considered it if it was free. Yeah, yeah, and I was actually surprised that Levon didn't go get one of the autographs because one of the guys was from uh, one of the Ninja Turtle movies. Yeah, I thought about it, and I, if I had known that he was going to be there, I probably would have brought the DVD and had him sign it. Fair enough. Um, and then I accidentally insulted him. Oh, you did? Well, yeah, when he was passing by and I didn't realize what I oh. said was, could be taken rudely. Yeah. <laughs> you told him that you hated those movies. No, <laughs> no, I didn't realize that like three or four of the celebrities passed right by us. As oh, many saying. times. Something about how, uh, well, yeah, like no one wants these people's <laughs> autographs. <laughs> yeah, he was going on and on about how they weren't real celebrities. Yeah, and I wasn't trying to be. <laughs> and rude, I was like, like elbowing him, and he. And then I look over like, oh shit, there's Donatello. <laughs> he couldn't take a hint on why I was elbowing him, and of course Elias was adding to it. So both of them are, you know, going on and on. I'm like, guys. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right there. laughs> yeah, and I felt like shit after that, but I've done. Worse it things happens. Than I mean, it could have been a lot worse. Could and I'm sure celebrity, so we were he smiled when you said it, so I'm yeah. sure he didn't have any delusions about the right. fact that he's not, you know, a celebrity celebrity, you know what I mean? 
they, it wasn't even that they weren't like celebrities. It was just they were background characters for most of. Okay, I kind of think that like in order to be a celebrity, you have to be recognizable in some way, shape, or form. Right. And well, I think that's more along the lines of what I said: is who would recognize him because he does the voice. Right. And I didn't mean it in an insult in any way. Like I was gonna go talk to him, but then I was just like. But then Elias added to it that in the Grinch who stole Christmas, he was like a five second part, you know, yeah. and da 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 da. It's not insulting to the guy, honestly. It's right. Showrunners, if they're going to have celebrities there, they should really investigate if this is somebody people in your area really want to see. Right, it's going to draw more people. Because the con itself probably paid an appearance fee for each and every one of the people who appeared. It was a celebrity. Yeah. I'm not paying an appearance fee if it's for somebody that people aren't going to get excited to come see. I think the coolest one that was there was the Batmobile. Probably. Yeah, the guy that was in the fake Adam and West And you could costume. see that in any friggin' car show you went to in yeah. this area. And if it's not the real Batmobile, you're not going to know the difference. It wasn't, <laughs> yeah. Like, no the only cares. really cool draw about right? that was that they had their weird photo gimmick that you could look like you're climbing up a building next to it. Like, yeah. Yeah, Cherry City had Adrian Paul, you know, the Highlander, yeah. at it last year. And I was like, okay, that's that's cool. I wouldn't mind going to meeting him. I didn't, but, you know, yeah. I wouldn't have minded. Like the... I the TV kind of, show Highlander. The guy with the long hair? Yes. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have long hair well, anymore, not, but yes. But I, that was a cool show. I remember watching it I love that show. That is one of my favorite shows of all time. The I remember watching it as a kid and thinking, they're, they're fighting with swords. This is badass. <laughs> There's a cool opening... <laughs> with this awesome song with Queen, yeah. yeah, hell yeah! I forgot about that. I love that show, but anyway, the show itself was okay. You know, I mean, like we made decent money, and you always know when you go eight hours, seven hours, whatever it was away, that it's going to be tricky to make your money back. Right. You know, you're taking a gamble. I would just say more than anything, I was more disappointed because the show we had done in Wenatchee the year before was such a bigger success that I thought I would get a similar crowd. But the crowd for the toy show was not the same at all right. for the crowd for the comic show. So I was kind of disappointed in that regard. That the two didn't translate so well. But that being said, there was a lot about it that was fun. Yeah. Uh, it was the first show I've ever done that was on an ice hockey rink. It was actually quite nice having something that yeah. kind of cooled down everything right below your feet, you know? Yeah. But it was, uh, I shouldn't have stored any of the inventory on the floor. Because when I went to pick it up at the end of the show, I had these glasses that were like on freezing boards, basically. So I pick them up, I'm like, oh, these are so cold. Oh, it's a good thing they didn't break. <laughs> <laughs> I was on one panel at that show. Yeah, I think that's about all I have to say on that one. Yeah. Oh, beyond and besides that, on the way to that show, we were going through this complete completely nothing ass area <laughs> sideways lights and okay i'm not even talking about that because that was in yakima so that was yeah. the least area people know about no as we were going through we passed through this area that was just you know like farmhouses here and there sort of area you know we have those areas around here we're going through and it's like four in the morning and Elias and Levon were yakking away at each other and not paying attention to what I was trying to point out to them. There was a junkyard on the right-hand side, right, where this guy who looked like he was out of a Rob Zombie movie was standing at the edge of in a white, flowy gown. <laughs> and by a Rob Zombie movie, I mean this motherfucker was as big as, like, Sid Haig and had that general sort of look about him. He looked like something in a Rob Zombie movie. Man, I wish I had seen And he's seen just that. like standing so at the edge weird. of the property in this white flow again. And I'm like, oh my god, I hope the car doesn't suddenly break down for no reason <laughs> at all. See, that's what your mom was worried about. She thought she right. you, you were going to get fed to that dude. Probably. Yeah, and I was just like, why if is I had he, seen him, I'd probably why is he standing on the edge of the property at three in the damn just morning? Just someone's car to get Standing hit. there in a white flowy gown in this junkyard looking place. Like, what the hell is going on here? He's distracting you while the other people down the road are getting ready to throw out something in That was actually yeah, something that I... The spikes on him. That's what I stated to these guys. I said, you guys keep... Be or uh, help me keep an eye out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we might be going towards something that, that guy radioed or something. Well, I think we were babbling on about the the cougar or whatever that we had seen. 
Yeah. We were talking about how we thought we were going to see Bigfoot, and instead there was just a big cat. Yeah, we were surprised because uh, going towards there in April, there was still snow on the ground in places. Yeah. When when my girlfriend and I were on our way to Lincoln City, uh-huh. we, we were driving, we were past Salem and all that, and it was just a little two-lane road, because you know it's a lot of that towards the beach. Right. And we come up on this, this farm area, because most of it is, there's right. an old, not too old looking barn, but an old looking barn, you can tell it's been there for a while. There's a big spray painted sign at the end of the gravel road for it, and pretty bad spray painting, and it said, Meat Locker is open. Ugh. That's... What? Yeah. Odd. <laughs> come on <laughs> and do the Meat Locker. Uh, okay. <laughs> y'all want to come in here and get some beef jerky? You can become part of the Meat Locker. Right. Yeah, no thanks. Feel <laughs> like a pig. So then in May, we did a free comic book day signing, a Cosmic Monkey, that I had to have Levon go along with me to because I completely lost my voice that morning. It was fun, though. It was. It yeah. was. I always enjoy doing anything at Cosmic Monkey or just being at their shop. I love that shop. Well, but, I mean, that was the first time I had to actually sit there and talk for you. Yeah. As opposed to, like, when Nachi, you guys left me at the table for ten minutes, but no one came up. Right. So, I mean, that was fun. It was actually trying yeah, to... Yeah, it was very interesting something. trying to figure out how to do a show or a signing when I had absolutely no voice. It, it's a signing. It's not a talking. No one wants to hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> then they should quit asking me questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... Was it Adam that there? Told me that I sounded like Tom Waits. So, you know, that was That's nice. That's a compliment. I thought so, too. Yeah. I thought it was, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, also in May, we did Sasquatch. And just to get out of the way, I'll say we did a Sasquatch in both May and October. And Frankenstein was both in March and June. And the reason I'm just saying all four of those is because all four of those are basically the same show, just in different areas. Right, there's not a whole lot to elaborate on each one. Uh, no, they both take place at an Elk's Lodge sort of place. Uh, you can find cheap comics at both of them. Uh, I would say between the two of them, you actually have a little bit better luck as an independent creator at Sasquatch. Yeah. I think just because there's not as, there's not as much competition with different shows around that area like there is in Portland. You know, Portland... You can go pretty much any shop or show and find somebody who's doing independent comics. Right. Uh, Eugene is a little bit more sparse, so that's probably the difference between what you do there with uh, independent comics. Not a lot to say about the shows other than they're both great, and I look forward to the yeah. next of uh, both of them. I would say, though, because the May Sasquatch was the first Sasquatch you did with me. Yeah. There is a guy that keeps continuously showing up there who seems to think that I'm his mentor. And I don't know fully what's wrong with Guy. He said he had Tourette's. I know Tourette's does weird things to you. I didn't think it did these sort of weird things to you, though. It didn't really seem like Tourette's. It didn't, well, I've never actually met anyone who has Tourette's. That's and a good that's point, the problem yeah. is that I only know a movie version of it. Right. I don't know what the real version is, you know? Let's see how how to describe it. Well, he was given a small table there that he didn't actually have any comics on. The city had like an 18-inch TV and a used, what was it? Was it a swimming pool it or an air swimming, mattress? It was a swimming pool uh, pump. Swimming pool pump. Yeah, so it was like what you used to pump your pool. It on. was like the weirdest random assortment of like garage sale items, right? <laughs> and he kept coming up to all of the dealers and trying to get them to trade him comics for his swimming pool pump and his TV. And Why you know, did you take like it? Well, I did actually make a trade with him for his video games, but I, I had no interest in the little 18-inch TV that I used to watch Perry Mason on when I was a kid. Wasn't interested in that. And, big uh, box TV? It, it was a little box TV. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They have knobs? Yeah, it had knobs. Oh, you should have got that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it was a black and white TV. That's okay. But beyond and besides that, I mean, the show was great. But I don't even know what type of comics this guy wants to create. But he he's came up to me at three different shows now. And he keeps continuously... Asking me if I'll meet up with him at a bar and teach him things about comics. And so I just kind of told him, you know, 
you need to just pick up things like comic book journal, things like that, and start reading them. That's how you'll learn about the comic book industry. Right. Listen to podcasts, do some stuff like that. that. If he wants to talk to you about that kind of stuff, you know, maybe sending an email would be better. Yeah, except that he has sent me emails, and every time he does, he starts sending me emails about how much money he has or doesn't have, which I don't know. Really? Yeah, I don't know what to make of something like that. I don't know if it means that he's looking to buy some of my stuff and he doesn't have the money right now and he's letting me know. I don't know. Whatever the case, I did end up giving him some comic industry magazines in exchange for his video games. So maybe he'll read them and maybe he'll learn some stuff. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't a rude guy or anything. He wasn't rude. No. He was just very off-putting. Yeah. I think that whenever he was around, he kind of had a funnel effect of people not really wanting to stick around your table and look at stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. He wasn't at the last Sasquatch we did, and I was actually pretty happy about that. Yeah. Frankenstein, Sasquatch, you know, we make a pretty a pretty similar amount at every single one of them. Yeah, the, thing, uh, the only thing that made the last We bombed one out at the was... last one, but there were a lot of factors that went into yeah, that. Yeah, they had two other shows, one in Salem, one out in Portland that day. There were two other shows. There was uh, some sort of football game or something or other going on that day. Right. There was... Uh, Something else going on in that area, like a a big outdoor flea market. That's what it was. Yeah. It was like a big outdoor flea market happening that day, which is apparently a really big thing in that area. There were a lot of things going against it that I don't think actually had anything at all to do with the show itself, nor did it make me any less inclined to want to go back to that show. Right. So. I'll keep going back to that show. I think it's a great show. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. As is Frankenstein, and we'll continue to get good stuff there too, you know? so Yeah. I mean, because where else are you going to find issues for your Lucifer collection for a quarter apiece, Robert? Well, really, anything that you want to start. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little Gordon's Law thing that I got for a buck. Yeah, you bought the whole entire series for yeah. a buck, right? Yeah. So, next up was another show that Levon helped me out at, which was Rustorama. That was the first time we ever attempted a car show. It was a lot of fun, though. Yeah, I gotta say, it wasn't set up at all like a normal car show in terms of the vendors. Yeah. Because they had an undercover, because uh, this is an outdoor car show, they had an undercover vendor area for people, and we were not the only people selling comics there. No, and I'm fucking thankful that it was covered. Oh, yeah. That was it was so day. bright yeah. and sunny and hot that day. It was miserably yeah, hot. Yeah, we were right all inside. concerned that there was going to be like some issues with like you know the sun hitting the items and stuff like that. And... Yeah. Yeah. Now, no, uh, we got, like, a nice I didn't area. actually expect to make any money at that show. I just figured it was just something we were going to and kind of writing off as an advertisement. You know, make an appearance somewhere that we had never been seen before. Maybe get a few more people just to recognize our character sort of thing, you know? Yeah. But we actually did make a profit at that show. And, uh, and got to see a lot of really cool rat rods. Yeah. So my dad showed up and brought my uh, boys along. And I got to walk around with them for quite a while during the show while Levon watched the table. Yep. And there were some really, really kick-ass rat rods there. A lot of them that would have fit in very well being parked in front of Crypticon. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. There was some cool stuff. And uh, some stuff you just don't see very often. Like this one guy had a 1938 school bus. And stuff like that's neat to see, you know, yeah. I think. So, you never did walk around and look at the cars, right? Um, I did briefly when I was sent to Walgreens. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Because I had to find the exit through there. Right, right, So, right. I didn't take a whole lot of time, like, examining them, but they were freaking sweet. I would definitely uh, consider doing that show again in 2019. More I wanted posters. to do t-shirts there this yeah. year and didn't get a chance to. If I do it again in 2019, I would really like to have some t-shirts at the ready. Um, the one thing I would say is I did expect to sell glasses there, and I think we only moved one shot. Yeah, it was one right one that uh, we sold with the lame I'm girl. Yeah, we we did a bundle deal. Yeah, and moved one. Um, I was kind of surprised by that. I kind of figured it would be a show that uh, glasses would actually do really well at. Yeah, I thought glassware was going to move there too. But there were people, a lot of people, who are buying T-shirts, and so. If I did that show again, yeah, on, yeah. If I did that show again, I would definitely want to incorporate uh, t-shirts into it. But as long as I don't have anything else going on that weekend uh, this year, and you know the price stays reasonably, uh, do price, they do it yearly? Yeah, I think so. Then I would definitely be up for doing it once again. Yeah, I thought that one was awesome. So yeah, is there anything else to say about that? 
as far for me, that was the the one that I got really comfortable with. Yeah. Um, the the last couple that I had done were like the warm ups. Mm-hmm. Uh, the free comic book day was definitely the I had to get out there and actually right. talk to people. Restorama was like a whole another situation, and it was where I was actually pushing sales. I was actually talking to the right. customers and having fun and like feeling like I was in my natural habitat and mm-hmm. not in a this is someone else's thing that I'm just kind of helping out on the side. Right. I shouldn't be intruding into talking to people and stuff like that. Makes but sense. It, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I felt really comfortable with it. The people there were super cool. So that was our eighth show of 2018. And I think we did, what, 16 to 18 in 2017, something like that? No idea. I don't remember these so things. So I averaged, if you just average it out by the year, I had averaged like two shows per month up yeah. until that point. And it was around that time that I just started getting severe con fatigue and just everything oh, fatigue. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it was pretty lot. constant for I a forgot while. about that. Yeah, 2017, we did a ton of shows. And there were shows in Tacoma, Eugene, Wenatchee. And so that is the show that I actually announced on the podcast after that I was taking a break from cons for a few months. Right. And I did. And that actually, you know, saved my brain. Because (laughs) I think had I pushed myself and done even one more show or signing, after that I would have totally burned out. Yeah. But instead I was hitting the burnout point and pulled back, and that was a smart move. Definitely. So then the next show I did was the Hillsborough Author Days uh, in September, that also happened at the Hillsborough Public Library. So I'd never done an Author's Day event before. Um, I have to say, between the two, I definitely like the comic show a lot better. Uh, but the Author Days was still fun. Made a few sales, you know, got to talk to some people that I'd met, that I'd already met actually at the comic show. I was on two panels at that show. Both of the panels were really good, really fun. They're actually part of the podcast updates. Um, they allowed me to record those, which I should have been asking if I could do at the other panels that I was on. But both of the panels went really well. The people that were on those sets of panels were by far and wide my favorite people to panel with out of any of the panels that I've done, that I did so far this year or that I did last year. So they were really great to panel with the lady who's moderating it did a fantastic job. I thought it was very well ran much like the comic swap. They gave us free food, free snacks, all that kind of stuff. Uh, My only sort of just thing I took note of with it is that when they do an author's days, there is not the flow that exists for when they did the comic days. So for the author days, they had comic creators here, poets over here, you know, prose writers here, sci-fi writers here. And when people walked in, I almost kind of feel like it was jarring to them in a way because yeah. there was no real flow to, it's not really a matter of the genre. It's more a matter of what type, you know, are you doing prose books? Are you doing poetry books or like a completely different sort of thing than a right. prose book or a comic, which is, you know, completely different yet again. I thought had they had that leveled a little bit better. Also, whereas the comic days drew in a ton of younger people. The author day seemed like it was almost entirely an elderly crowd. I could see that, yeah. So, I would definitely be up for doing more author days in the future. It definitely has a much different feel than a Comic Con or a Horror Con or anything like that. But I kind of need to do more than one of them before I give a full right breakdown on what the differences are exactly. So then, the last show we did that year was Sasquatch, which we've already covered. So is there anything you guys want to say about 2018 before we close this out? Well, my... There's a lot of plans we have for 2019, but that is actually going to be for one of the upcoming podcasts. And my portion of it that I spent with you guys I thought was awesome. Definitely a different world for me. Yeah? But... Yeah, it's pretty odd to get in a car with a strange person and uh, go somewhere <laughs> yeah. with them. And then try to sit behind a table at something you've never done before. Well, and then try to pay for your food and they're like, no, it's cool. I pay for all of your guys' food because you help me out. I'm like, this is weird. I don't really know you that well. Why are you buying me food? Oh, did I buy you food? Yeah, when we oh, went you, to... Oh, you were my con helper. That's why. Yeah, but I wasn't used to that. I was just like, oh, no, it's cool. I got my, <laughs> I got my buffalo chicken covered. And you're like, no, it's all good. <laughs> hey, crappy Wenatchee. I think the first show 
I think the first show that I did with him was uh, 2016. Would have been Crypticon. This is before 2016. Was it? It, it, it was, was 2015. 2015. It could have been. I don't recall. I do. Sure, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Adam knows everything. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess. We didn't do Crypticon in 2017 or 18. We did it in 2014, 15, and 16. You were my helper at both 2015 and oh, 2016. Yeah, I did two of them. So, yeah, yeah. That, 2015, that would have been the first one. So, say once again, sure you do, motherfucker. Sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta add that motherfucker part. Motherfucker. Anyway, go on. <laughs> oh, that that was my first experience. It was weird. Hadn't done anything like that. Hadn't even been to a con. Well, see, I'd been to cons before, but it was the first time being behind the table. Yeah. Which, I mean, it was awesome, and it felt like a whole new step up in my game, but it was definitely different, and not what I expected. First time meeting Elias... Um, so I wasn't sure how he would feel See, with me going that's the with the guys. I and... wasn't a complete stranger to him. He had, in fact, like bought comics from me before. We had chatted several times at his work, you know, because he works right across the street from where I live. Yeah. But you had never, ever met him before, right? Nope. I hadn't met any of anyone here up until then because I think... I don't remember if I helped get everything ready for Wenatchee or you that did not. was Sasquatch. Sasquatch you did. Wenatchee, yeah, so I had never just, been uh, inside of your house yeah. uh, meeting the kids and everything. So it was like walking into someone's house and be like, I'm going to go hang out with you. And I have no idea anything about <laughs> you guys. I'm pretty sure that's how everyone becomes friends with Adam. For some reason, you end up inside his house. Well, I mean, like I've knocked on his door before buying stuff off Craigslist. But, yeah, that was the first time actually walking in and I'm standing in the kitchen all awkwardly while the kids, like, hoard me. Show me your drawings! You draw, show me your drawings! <laughs> yeah, sorry about the fact there are, like, 20 of them. Yeah, I just sort of ended up here one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could just walk down the street and you're like, I'm gonna go knock on that house. Well, I'd, I'd come over maybe a time or two before with my brother. Right. And then, I don't know, I couldn't tell you why or how. Or what my reasoning was. See, we already knew each other better by the time you left your car here. Uh, you know what I think it was? Your friends that lived down the street weren't home yet. And you were waiting for them to come home. And you just asked if you could hang out until they got home. Could have been. Because you didn't feel like driving back home since you knew they'd be there soon. Well, that could have been it. That makes sense. So, so, yeah. You just sort of end up in this <laughs> house. <hanging out> with <laughs> Magnet. <laughs> Then you either become friends with me or I ban you from my house, one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about how about for for what you read that you liked for twenty eighteen? Okay. Like a, so at on the wrap up show or maybe it was the beginning of two thousand eighteen show last year, we had actually listed our reading goals and I had stated two things that I want to make sure I read by the end of two thousand eighteen. One was that massive, massive strangers in paradise omnibus that I have. Mm -hmm. I still haven't read it. The other <laughs> that thing, massive. I know. The other thing was I wanted to get through all seven volumes of the Max hardcover, and I did. Nice. That reading goal I did accomplish, and I got to say, out of everything I read in 2018, that's my favorite thing. I I got through the second colder. I didn't really read a whole lot of comics this year, but uh -huh. I really liked that one. I read something that a friend at work gave me. Did Could... you just say you really liked Colder Volume? Not Colder. Uh, uh, okay. Nail Biter. Oh, know. Nail Biter. Okay, Not okay. Cold. Completely different. Uh, <laughs> and I don't, I don't know what it was that she gave me. I can't remember. That was that one that had that sort of watercolor looking style where everything's kind of almost free form. There's no uh -huh. lines. But it was about a. It was futuristic. There are these androids that look like people and they're like sort of companions to to people and they were artificially intelligent and they get this signal from one that they thought that all these originals were gone because then it then uh the, everything got too smart and started attacking uh -huh. and trying to take over and humanity was like fleeing it was a really interesting story mm -hmm. because you were seeing a flashback of this little boy robot that had these memories of this kid that he was the companion for. Huh. But he can't... Those people are dead. Huh. And he was in storage for, like, safe mode sort of thing for a long time. 
Interesting. And there was like this big sort of reveal thing at the end, but I don't know what happens next. <laughs> and I don't know the name of it. I have to ask her. Well, you'll have to look into that so you can talk about it later. Because I, I'm not familiar with I thought at first you might be talking about a Philip K. Dick story, but then... No, it was something new. Yeah. I don't remember what it was. Besides that, everything else I read were... Actually, I guess they didn't do a whole lot of physical reading. I listened to books. Uh-huh. So... Oh, I, I will throw in an honorable mention. So the Max story was definitely my favorite, but... I got to say one thing, I had no idea if I would like it or not, and I never heard of it before, is a book called Space Riders that is put out by a company called Black Mask. I was familiar with them as a company. I'd heard about a few things they did, because I know there's like some really successful Kickstarters that they published after they were Kickstarters, I think, but I could have that wrong. They might have already been uh, under the company, but I was at a garage sale in November of all months to have a garage sale, right? And these people had a copy of this trade paperback for two bucks. I picked it up, thought the art looked interesting, so I offered them a buck for it, because that's what I do when I'm at garage sales. They said yes, I took it, and I read it a couple weeks later. And I gotta say, it was one of the most enjoyable books I read all year long. So I'd heard that this company wasn't that great of a company in terms of comic publishing, I got no idea on the rest of their stuff, but I got to say, this this book was fantastic. Is it an actual book? No, it's a graphic novel. Oh, okay. But uh, it's, artwork-wise, it's kind of like a mix of something that would be in the psychedelic sort of like late 60s, early 70s sort of era, mixed with more kind of, uh, what's his name who did Rat Fink? Ed Roth. Ed Roth, like almost sort of that style, you know. So it's almost kind of like Jack Kirby and Ed Roth Ooh. mixed together in a way, right? And it's a it's a space faring adventure, as the name Space Riders would suggest, you know. Yeah. In terms of the story, it's not even that anything was that exceptional, you know, because it's a it's your basic revenge story. But I got to just say the art, the writing was really good because the the dialogue was really crisp. It gave you a strong sense of who the characters were even when the characters were supposed to just be kind of like stupid throwaway characters, the dialogue was still good enough right. that that you got a sense of who everybody was. It definitely would have passed the lights out test. Do you guys know what the lights out test is? No. Okay, so when you're writing comics, imagine that all of a sudden all the artwork in a panel disappeared and went black. And all you're left with is dialogue balloons. Can you still tell which character is which? Mm. When you look at like yeah, the original Ninja Turtles comics... Yeah. That fell's lights out test. Right. You cannot tell the difference between Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello if you take away their weapons, right? Right. So, but this definitely would have passed the lights out test. And the lights out test, by the way, is just something I call it. Uh (laughs) No, but that's an interesting concept. Do other people think of that sort of stuff? Do they? Uh, Some do. I know there are some who do. Well, it sounds Um, like something that some writers that are really good would think about. I yeah. think it's important that you think about that kind of stuff. If you actually want your characters to come across as real people rather than just, you know, one-dimensional type things. Right. But uh, I don't think enough writers do take that kind of stuff into consideration. No. I hadn't even thought about it. Yeah. That is a really interesting concept. But, you know, I don't want the only differentiation between David and Todd to be that one has blue lettering and one has black. Right. I want you to be able to tell the difference with the way they speak with the way they think, you yeah. know. In this book, totally accomplish that. Every character is unique, and the artwork was just straight up fun. That so well good. worth the buck yeah. that I spent, and I would actually consider spending full price on the second volume. Nice. Wow. Well, no, I'd, I'd do more than consider it. I actually would buy it for full price at either a bookstore or a comic shop. Hmm. Full price on it's only twelve ninety nine. So yeah, That's not bad, I mean, though. Yeah. I'd gladly spend that to read the second volume because if it's if it's even three quarters as enjoyable as I found the first one, then it's well worth it. Yeah. So anyway, what was your favorite thing you read, Levo? Oh, well, I had a lot of stuff that I read this year because, like I said, I dug through your boxes, and as we did each show, I would come back with more and more crap. Uh huh. Um, I gotta say, the only one that I actually went out and purposely bought though was I Hate Fairyland. Which was the first book that you guys were telling me about in Wenatchee. I did finish I up volume three it. and four of I Hate Fairyland. Yeah, I, I bought the first one. I was so disappointed because it's the end of it. 
It only went four volumes. Yeah. Well, they're still doing it. No, they're not. Really? Yeah, Scott, I'm pretty positive. I'm about 90% positive Scotty Young finished it at the end of volume four. Maybe I only have three then. Because I know that the last one came out right after we had gone to Things from Another World the last time. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't have volume four. Um, Yeah, because I know that I bought one and then I went out and bought the other two the next time we went to Things from Another World Uh uh, at full price, like $18.99 a piece. Right. I was like, I enjoyed it that much. And that was something that I had price. no idea what it was. Yeah. It is enjoyable enough. Yeah, I actually enjoyed it. The cover price isn't that bothersome. That's actually something we need to talk about on the pricing episode, too, yeah. by the way. Well, that and that I paid 10 bucks for the I Hate Image, just the single <laughs> right. throwaway comic. Like, <laughs> I enjoyed that one, too. But yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I read and a lot of stuff that I haven't. Um, Transmetropolitan is I Hate Fairyland, the... just to let you know really quickly, is... The cutest artwork you can imagine about a little girl who gets sucked into fairyland and she's too stupid to just follow their simplistic map that will get her the key to leave. Instead goes all evil and starts destroying and eating everything in fairyland. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the mushroom people she commits genocide on because she's like picking them up and putting them on her pizza. And That's funny. Yeah, yeah she blows hilarious. a hole through the moon and she kills the giants of like the sleeping valley and She's just on, like, this completely murderous rampage. But everything about it, because Scotty Young's art, everything about it is cute as hell. Yeah. So, it's it's fantastic. It's I highly, story. highly recommend oh, picking yeah. that one up. The, the plot twist at the end of, like, Volume 1 or 2. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was great. Don't spoil it. Or maybe it wasn't Volume <laughs> 2, it would have been 3. But yeah. Yeah, definitely read it. That was so. one that I had no idea what it was, and then... Looked it up after we got back from the con, and I was like, huh. So I Hate Fairyland was your favorite? Yeah. Um, yeah. I still need to read see Transmetropolitan. That. Transmetropolitan uh, is great. We picked that one up at Sasquatch, and it's been on my shelf with oh, all my other books. You haven't read that one yet? No. Okay. I have a stack like this tall of stuff. That, that is definitely one, too, up. that once you read the first volume, you'll probably want to go out and get all the others. Yeah. I think... that's what happened with me with Transmet. I think I have the second or third volume of that, just randomly. Oh, yeah? <laughs> a lady at work gave it to me. Huh. She's like, I have this in my house. You want it? I don't. I'm, it's not mine. Oh. It's not mine, but you can have I it. Well it, was her, it was her son's. <laughs> no, <laughs> but he didn't really care. <laughs> but it was just. It's like it's. I maybe. I think it's only number two. But I was like, oh, uh, okay, yeah, I'll take it. I don't have the first one, but that is sure. Transmetropolitan is great. It's a very very high up there in terms of things that Vertigo released. I would say it's like. Preacher, Why the Last Man, Transmetropolitan, Scalped. Those are the best four books that I can think of. That they, oh, it's Sandman. I always forget Sandman's a Vertigo book, honestly. Because yeah, I it wouldn't have kind of seems either. like it's, you know, just beyond all of that. Those are definitely the best things that I can think of the Vertigo's ever released. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to get the first Part one. of the reason that I like uh, those so much, too, I think, is because they're not open-ended stories. You know, Transmetropolitan, Why the Last Man, Preacher, Sandman. Those all, in Scalped, those all had endings. You know, and granted, DC these days is kind of making it to where Sandman doesn't really have an ending. Yeah. But <laughs> but that's not the way Neil Gaiman envisioned it to begin with, so I'm just going with this specific volume from back then, you know? Yeah. Now, things that you want to read in 2019. I have to say, after watching the Lucifer TV show, I very much want to track down all the volumes of Lucifer and read them. I want to finally get around to finishing Strangers in Paradise. <laughs> You'll get there one day. <laughs> right? <laughs> you guys? I'd say read a few more comics, because I, I didn't really read that many. Okay, fair enough. I didn't read a whole lot of anything. Indeed. Most things that I... Most books that I got there were all audio books. Well, there's something wrong with that, though. You put it yeah. on while you're doing other stuff instead of having to sit to read it, so... Yeah, yeah I listen to them at work. That's when yeah, I'm so listening I mean, to convenient. podcasts from various people. It so. upped how many books I managed to get through in a year, too. Because I used to not really read at all, and then I read a few books every year. Mm-hmm. And then this year, I think I made it through 16 books. That's pretty decent. Yeah. I'd never managed that before. I never yeah. read so many I books in my through, life. I like, two books. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm a super slow reader. Ah, uh, me too. Um, That's why I went to audiobooks. The dyslexia kicks in and it makes it really Back hard. when I was your guys' age, and I wasn't quite as busy as what I am now, I would generally read one novel every single day. Holy crap. Yeah. 
the I was listening to an interview with the lady that used to run. And I novels. am not talking about a graphic novel, by the way. Yeah. I'm talking a novel. This is the lady that used to run Pals. She just retired. Uh huh. They were. The interviewer was asking her about this vacation that she took. That she said she read one book a day while on vacation. Yeah. It's on vacation. Come that on. sounds like a great vacation to me. Ugh. If That's I could stop me. working for just one full day and just have time to just read all day and no kids were bothering me or anything like that, that'd be the greatest vacation I can think of. <laughs> I could never make it through a book in a day. I'm way oh, too slow. But I then could. I get tired reading. And, like My eyes get tired and then I get tired and I just want to fall asleep. I could see that. I could see that. You know, the only thing that ever really did that one to me is Hellboy. Because Hellboy has the juxtaposition between black and red which when the two are added together and laid against each other, can actually make your uh, eyes trigger a sleepy time mode. Does the exact, hmm. Yeah, it does the exact opposite of seeing blue and white, which tells you that it's time to be awake, right? Yeah. Red and black are sleepy time colors. If I'm really tired, I can't read Hellboy because <laughs> there's so much black and so much red in it that I'll start to kind of drift as I'm reading it. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, that feels like a good place as any to stop for tonight. Yeah. In the coming weeks, we're going to be interviewing uh, Mr. Sam Quentin again about his Kickstarter relaunch for 47 Furious Tales, and we're also going to be delving into comic book pricing once again. We're going to do a part three on that. Yeah, there is enough material that we need to do one more podcast. There's always more material. Right, and then somewhere in there, we're also going to be doing 2019 plans, where I'm going to be telling you guys some of the plans, and we're going to be talking to Levon. To see how he's doing with the things he's supposed to be doing. Yep. So <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, get that shit done. Oh, yeah. This is Adam Watson. Robert Diaz. Levon Baker. Thank you for listening.